Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you. It's uh, an absolute pleasure to introduce Jerry today because um, as the ASTN, the Australian Sports Technologies Network, um, Jerry was one of those people who actually said, well, if you do want to do it right, you have to understand what the value of the ecosystem is. And I guess, Jerry, that, that went back to when you moved into one of those ecosystems and, and sat down and, and wrote or started to write about what uh, global clusters of innovations are. And let me give you a, a, a brief um, rundown of, of why we believe this is so uh, important. Um, and you'll hear about that and, and something that I, as a, as a chemist and chemical engineer, can appreciate. Jerry talks about covalent bonds, the strongest links between people that have uh, innovate, in, innovative ecosystems and actually come together. So a covalent bond, for those of you that don't know, is the strongest bond between two atoms and a pair of electrons zooming around. So in a sense, I feel sometimes like an electron because I'm going around between all of these different places, um, but that's just a side note. Um, why was this important uh, for the ASTN? Because we've now established relationships um, that are contractually agreed with a number of uh, like-minded networks around the world, in the US, in Europe, and in China. And that, this is very important because in some of our programs, for instance, our trade missions, we've now introduced about 60 companies to overseas markets through our networks with the help of the federal government, Austrade, um, the Victorian government, uh, Global Victoria, what used to be Trade Victoria. And the numbers actually start to come together quite impressively. So about the 30 companies that went through the Accelerator program, Jointly, they created about 150 jobs, um, not only in Victoria, but also in, in overseas offices. They uh, generated revenue uh, beyond of what they were doing uh, in the order of magnitude of 48 million. And um, they raised about $4 million in funds on their journey of growth. Two have exited and become a part of a larger group. And we believe that this is part of what ecosystems do because it's, it's very hard and, and sometimes for me, uh, myself, I certainly can't pick the winners sometimes and, and I know government doesn't want to do that or, or, or says we, we can't pick favorites, but it's actually the ecosystem that helps them to develop uh, into winning companies. And so it's really, really great, Jerry, that you, you made the way because um, um, on the other side, I'm, I'm obviously looking forward to come back to, to Haas at the end of October, but uh, it's really great to have you here. Welcome. You. Martin, you've done a, a great job of welcoming me. It's uh, fantastic to be here uh, in an accounting firm's offices. Now you say, that's a strange way to start a discussion. So why do I... Uh, say it's great to be here in an accounting uh, firm's offices. Well, OK, who am I? And then you look up there, and you're going to see that somewhere in here, big company experience, it says Ernst & Young, and it might say other things. It might say KPMG. And um, I'm going to tell you a story, OK, rather than showing you a bunch of words about who I am. Uh, I got to be here today, to have the privilege of talking with you. Um, it started a long time ago, once when I was lost in the woods here of career, uh, maybe I graduated from a school, oh, but I went to work for an accounting firm. And this is important, why? We heard briefly this morning about the importance of professional service providers. We heard briefly this morning about the importance of clusters and communities. You might say, well, bookkeepers, what do they have to do with anything? Aren't they people who just come around after the fact and keep track of what has happened and help tell history in an accurate way? And that's what I thought bookkeepers and accountants and auditors were until I got experience enough in my career 
to realize that it was teams of professionals, going beyond the accountants, of course, the lawyers and uh, you know, HR professionals, advertising professionals, et cetera, gathered around nascent ideas and gathered around teams of entrepreneurs that were so critically under-resourced, so critically striving every day just to achieve what we now call product market fit, that they couldn't be investing in all the ancillary things needed to build a business. And they couldn't, uh, in any case, even if they could invest in them, they wouldn't know what they should look like because they really didn't know where they were going. They were in a, on a journey. They were on a journey toward building a repeatable and scalable business model. And so every day was an experiment. Does this customer want this or do they want that? What really gives them joy? What gives them real satisfaction? So you can't sit around and say, let's build the right HR organization. Let's build the right accounting organization. What kind of financing should we have? You really need others who have a broader tableau. So in a way, that's part of the key message for today. And nobody set me up for this. Nobody said, hey, Jerry, get up there and sell accounting services. Right? But I just find myself here in these absolutely first class, outstanding you know, uh, settings, saying, boy, this doesn't feel like a startup. But it does, in that it's these kind of partners that startups need. So how many of us in the room are on the startup side of the world, actually involved? In, come on, no, none of this. I saw that. You did this. That's not, come on. If you're, let's see it. I want to know where you are. OK. So the rest of us are not. So why are we here? So either you just didn't respond. So I'll give you one more chance if you're on the entrepreneurship side to raise your hand. Otherwise, you're never going to get a chance the rest of the day. So don't think you're going to get comfortable and get there. OK, are you on the entrepreneurship side, yes or no? Yes. Oh, OK. So two thirds of us are, OK? So the other third of us, why are we here? We're here because you need us. <laughs> you don't think you do. But you need us. Why do you need us? It's because we've been around this block before. And maybe we've been around it 10 or 20 or 50 times. And we failed a bunch of times, but we've learned a few lessons. And you know what? You're not going to get that many rolls of the dice. If you're an entrepreneur, you're in this thing. This thing you're in, you may not realize it, but you're in it for the next at least 10 years. Why? Because you've taken a dollar from somebody else. Or you've hired somebody who has sacrificed a great career opportunity to come work with you. If either of those are true, and it's true for all of you, you've made a 10-year commitment. It may be longer, but it's a minimum of seeing something through to the very last effort you have to make it work. Because it's not just a responsibility to yourself, not just a responsibility to your family, which you can gauge and take responsibility for. But it's a responsibility to third parties who you cannot gauge, and therefore you must go and do what it takes. So if you're going to do that, you need help. And if you're going to do that, it's going to take you, why do I say 10 years? Well, how long do you think it's going to take to get product market fit? Do you think your great idea is right? It's wrong. Whatever your great idea is, it's wrong. Doesn't mean it's a thousand percent wrong, but it's going to be a journey. Now you're going to take this turn, that turn. It's going to take three or four years to get real resonance, real feedback, real strong you know, customer retention metrics, real strong scaling. And that's three or four years. And then you've got to get liquidity. Because whether you believe it or not, I'll say something you're going to hate to hear. Am I only on slide one? Oh my god. Uh, You don't know it yet, perhaps. Maybe you do if you're experienced. But you're in the business right now of selling your enterprise. You think you're building your enterprise? You're selling your enterprise. You're going to sell it incrementally every day. How do you sell your enterprise incrementally? Well, any investor. You make a pitch. They buy your pitch. They make an investment. You've not only given up some equity. That's the trivial part. 
You've sold it because you've made a pitch, and that pitch constrains your flexibility. So you're selling freedom. Every customer you make a promise and commitment to is to the extent of the nature of that relationship being longer term, or you need to retain it, is a sale of your freedom. So you're entering into a path where you're committing yourself actually to greater and greater constraints. It will take longer and longer times to see through the path, and you have to see it through the liquidity. Why? Because sooner or later, you're going to raise money from investors. I mean, while investors are well-meaning, and they're with you all the way, and they want you to build value, you owe them an obligation to have the opportunity to get out. Because that's an intrinsic part of the investor contract. We're going to be great. Well, how does that help me? It helps you because you're going to make money. Now, you're not in it only to make money. You're in it because you believe in what we're doing. But every entrepreneur has an obligation to their investors to work with them toward a shared liquidity event. So this is a very complex environment. It's not just about having a great product and a great opportunity. So that's what to pitch the value of your accountants. Lawyers, Indian chiefs, those of us on the SI, that's what we understand that you may or may not understand yet deeply. And that's the journey we can help you on. And I got introduced to that journey somewhere in the 80s when I changed accounting firms into another accounting firm that gave me the opportunity to focus on working with young and emerging businesses, much like we heard this morning from our hosts about working and focusing on innovation, much the way you are. It gave me to work with technology enterprises so that in the 90s, when I went to academia, I was able to offer my students a broader perspective than simply what was in the books. And that's what we're going to start to discuss today, is how do you take the knowledge that you can get today on books or in online, nothing I have to share with you today, you couldn't, you know, the subject matter itself couldn't be conveyed beautifully in some other medium, but it's the experience and the context. So you want to work and be seeking people. I had the good for fortune to maybe found a business or two, be on boards for long periods of time, to work with major corporations, work with technology enterprises, found a venture capital fund or two. And now, as an old man, if you will, I get to advise. And these are all uh, venture funds I advise. These are companies I advise. Uh, these are academic institutions I get to advise. And because I'm such a wise old man, I write books every once in a while. This is the one that I'm not trying to sell you, but was referred to earlier. And I'm going to use some of the concepts captured there. It's 13 case studies of 13 economies around the world. And what did I learn by studying them? So what I learned was to reflect on my own home, University of California, Berkeley, and see what could be generally applied and what could not. What, where did my home institution fit? Well, one of the things I learned was important to government. You say, well, why, why is that important if you're at a university? Because one of the things universities do is they create knowledge. And who do you think pays for that knowledge? $700 million of federal research dollars every year. University of Melbourne, I was there on Thursday and Friday. Their federal research budget in Australia, one billion. It's about the same, 700 million US, one billion Australian. Amazing. What's the entrepreneur's opportunity? To get aware of what's going on there. We're going to hear about the power of analytics. Where do you think that knowledge came from originally? A lot of you are in sports tech. You're in sensors. You're in IoT. Whatever it is you're in. Where did that originate? So, but we know professors don't put it to work. It's you who put it to work. These are mobile people. We call them students. The room's full of them. You're all students, right? You're all learning rapidly and iterating to put ideas to work. Now, institutions, I was referring to the professions in general. Well, this is where my office is at the High School of Business. Bob, you've been there with me. James, you've been there with me. But 
The reason to put up a building is that institutions, like this accounting firm, you know, things that have a longer lifetime than the venture itself are important because they provide the institutional setting or continuity for us to build and leverage. And all of us strive to build companies that lead in our marketplaces. And we don't want to be leading because we're greedy or leading because we're clever. Right? We want to add value to ourselves and to society. So we lead through innovation. That happens to be the slogan of my business school. I bet it could be a slogan you could apply to your partners. Why do you need to lead through innovation? Because the world's changing rapidly, right? It's changing faster. You're not surprised by that. Well, why else do you need to lead through innovation? Because the world is stupid. It's led by stupid people. I don't know if you have Blockbuster on every corner of every town in this, in this world here. Certainly do it did in the US. Anybody know Blockbuster? Yeah? Can anybody find one today? No, right? And this is just 2008, right? So in like 10 years, this guy goes from being on top of the world to being totally irrelevant and out of business. 10 years. You know, and you could have dust. Dust to dust. Oh, only happened to that one company. No. In the United States, I mean, there used to be one company that could do transcontinental communication. It was Western Union. They had something called the Telegraph. Well, what buried them? Was it technology? No. Alexander Graham Bell brought the, to Western Telegraph the telephone and said, here you go, buddies, license it. You know, I just want to make a few bucks. They said, nah, not our business. You know, we do this da 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 business. We don't need that toy. You know, play that back to the internet. You know, play it anywhere you want. But, you know, how many of you have an Apple IV watch on your wrist? I mean, hold them up, right? There they are. So, I mean, it's the same story over and over and over again. So, here we are in Australia. Where do we fit? We're, I know we want to feel we're in the middle of the world. We're in Melbourne. But you know what? We're really over here. And if geography matters and innovation, well, you want to be in the heart of things. Because the marketplaces that matter today are global, right? It's a winner-take-all world. You either are the dominant player or you're hanging on for dear life. And you better believe it. So you might think you have a great idea and a great product, and there's always going to be room for your niche little product. No. There will be for a little while, but when it gets under the lens of the powers that be, they'll either kill you or acquire you. Acquiring you may not be such a bad thing. Killing you is not fun. So geography plays. Because if you're over here on this island, I know you're, not, you're going to hate me for saying this, but on this island with 24 million people, you know, and then there's the United States, another island, believe it or not. I mean, it's a, with 350 million people. And then we got China up here, another island. We're all on really islands of our own making of 1.3 billion people. Start looking at your demographic trends. Geography is going to matter to you. So how can an ecosystem drive innovation? Well, there's the fable of the garage. I don't know what your parallel is in Australia, but in Silicon Valley, we say, well, there was a garage. And leveraging government money, these were defense contracts initially, we built an electronics industry. And that built a society that had many, many experiences with building new industries. True. You look for sociological commonalities, you could say, well, it was all IT. Well, it wasn't all IT, right? You get around to health tech and other things. 
It was interdisciplinary. Why is that important? Because it comes down to behavior. We're going to hear a lot about behavior this morning. If I want to show you a map of where I'm from, there's an old map. It shows you silicon. The map I can't really show you well is the networks of people. It happens to be a picture of a president I am still proud of, Obama. Don't mention my current president, please. But you know, with the business leaders of Silicon Valley, at a moment when Silicon Valley became recognized as a cultural leader, until then it was a bit of a backwater. It was LA. Obama would have gone to LA and been with all the movie stars. Now, society's changed. They still go to LA, but oh, they stop by Silicon Valley and meet with the, the people. So the people interacting are more important than what the components are. So when you go to talk to people about their innovation clusters in Thames River, London, Barcelona, Munich, oh my god, Melbourne, and people show you a map. And they're very proud of, oh, we have Fisherman's Bend, and we have Monash, and all these wonderful things. Nice, but not enough. Not enough, not enough. What's more important is, is what's going on in this room. So seriously, take a good look. Forget these slides. Look at each other for a minute. Just look back there. Come on, look, look, look at each other. You're more important than the, you know, all these things. People take me about accelerators and incubators and that. Nice. The only reason they're important is because it gets people together forming these casual networks. We call these weak ties. And these weak ties, these social ties, these interactions are the premise for trust. And that leads to lower transaction costs. Really, a guy got a Nobel Prize for this, OK? There are actually a couple. But while Oliver Williamson, one of my colleagues at Berkeley, you know, got a Nobel Prize for tracking the impact of transaction costs on the innovation of society. Michael Porter did it earlier in his own way. So nice buildings are important, but they're only important because they get people together. So when I was in Tel Aviv giving a, a comparable discussion to a comparable group, and the mayor whipped out his set of accelerators and incubators. I said to him, you know, I snapped a picture last night going back to my hotel. It's more important than your darn map. This is a picture of a meeting that's going to happen tomorrow. And, you know, I just happened to notice they were hanging this banner about, hey, it's cool to be a geek, and we're all going to get together. So here you are. You are more important than you know, 89 little strategies and communities, and look, this is it for you. This is where you build velocity. JD, wh wh when was it, what year was it that we got together in 212? From 212, well, yeah, but 212 we sat around a few people in a room, right? And you guys said, well, we can make this happen. And I said, good luck to you, but this is what you ought to do, and you, here we are. And I'm sure you're doing much more than this meeting, but this is an example. So Porter, Michael Porter, very famous dude, right? Harvard University, five forces, all of my business colleagues here are going, oh yeah, I studied, studied Michael Porter. He told us that these concentrations are important, but the way he defined concentration was by industry. You know, sports tech, industry, important, important. But there's something more important, which is that I learned in Silicon Valley, you know, it's not all electronics. It's healthcare and it's automobiles. And why? Because the community is not only premised on concentration, like sports tech, but also on a style. And again, the importance of the profession. The community has to, not has to, but if it evolves a style, where it lowers the threshold to new business formation, lowers the threshold to investment through active angel networks, et cetera. You accelerate the whole process of innovation in the community, and things like the sports network have a better home to reside in. So this geography of innovation has a lot of elements. And you're going to find yourself up there, and you're going to say, well, where do I fit? 
am I an entrepreneur? Am I coming technology? Am I one of these guys grabbing tech out? Am I an investor or am I a guy raising money? Or am I a major corporate, which is key, the secret to this concept of the seven components of a cluster innovation is the role of the major corporates. And we always ignore them. We make them the bad guys. They can be the good guys, because they have customers. What do we want? Let's say it together. What do we want? Oh, come on, guys, gals. What do we want? Customers! Because no business, I've studied this, no business fails for want of, what do you think? It fails because it runs out of money? No. It, if you have customers, you don't run out of money. Because if you have happy customers, either they give you enough money, or investors give you enough money to get more of them. Businesses fail for lack of customers, and what do major corporations already have? Millions and millions of customers. What do they need? Innovation. More stuff to give those customers. There's a natural reason for congruence. That's the secret sauce. Don't tell them I told you so. Keep it a secret or use it. Government sometimes plays a major role. Sometimes major corporations play a more dominant role. Every community is different. I'm only saying these seven components can help you identify, give you a framework for thinking about it, make sure you're not overlooking the contribution any element can make. And for us here in Australia, on this island of 24 million, Martin Orr referred to it, the key is linkage to the other comparable clusters of innovation around the world. So you want to have friends in Singapore, you want to have friends in Beijing, you want to have friends in San Francisco, you want to have friends in London. And the friends you want to have are people like yourself who are building value, striving for opportunity that go beyond the resources they have under control, the definition of entrepreneurship. And sometimes, if you form super great relationships, the two communities begin to operate in a synchronicity. It's like sleeping next to your wife in bed. It's been studied, your breathing patterns begin to sync together. When you're asleep, you're probably breathing like the person next to you. You shouldn't say wife, your spouse, your other, right? You want to work with people that have similar values that you do, and your way of doing business will begin to sync with them over time. So the transaction cost goes down because you know how they're going to behave. You can expect certain reciprocity, and you form these super connections that I like to call covalent bonds. So lots of opportunities we understand, lots of strategies we can anticipate. An opportunity I would suggest is that major corporations are slow. We're fast. We are agile. They want to collaborate with us for that reason. Working with venture capitalists can be great, but they can be scarce. So when they're scarce, we have to look to our individual relationships and individual investors, and we have to look to government subsidies and understand those pathways, and we have to look to corporate investors when appropriate. In all of it, you want win-win strategies and structures, and hopefully that's what we're going to hear from our legal team today, about not win-lose, but win-win. So what's win-win in my book? Things like royalty structures can be win-win, or they can be win-lose. What makes something go from win-win to win-lose? 
little things like exclusivity and rights of first refusal. I'm sure we'll hear more about those later. But those, oh, it's a great deal, but we just need this, you know, preemptive right if, blah, blah, blah. That just <coughs> made it win-lose. So knowing how to structure things in a win-win way and having a culture that supports it. Like in my hometown, if I put an equity deal on the table representing a corporation and said, oh, it's fine, we're going to invest alongside the VCs and at their valuation and they can set the terms, we're the friendly investor, we only need a right of first refusal if that would just kill the deal right there because everybody in the culture that I live in understands rights of first refusal are unfair. The corporate guy says, oh, it's fair, look, we're taking a blah, blah, blah. No, it caps the upside. No, it preempts other investors from wanting to take a comparable participation. And these things have to become cultural norms so that you don't have to fight these arguments one at a time. So, how is that relevant to us? Well, we have new emerging technology spaces. We have augmented reality and virtual reality. This is the easy stuff, right? Sports tech, oh yeah. So we're gonna focus on customer experience or team performance or remote and local viewing, all affected by augmented and virtual reality. Or it might be a different experience. Oh. Data analytics, we're going to hear about the power of data analytics. I think it's a hell of a presumption for anybody to tell a bunch of sports tech guys about data analytics. I mean, who wrote Moneyball? Right? We all, I hate to do this, but let me see the hands. How many of us are familiar with the concept of Moneyball? Yeah, that's why I want to see affirmation. Okay, you know, my home team. Thank you very much. Okay, gambling. I have a real aversion to gambling. I hate it, but guess what? It's the world we live in. And anything you want to call fantasy sports by another name is gambling, right? Because as soon as you let people build the capacity to say, my team is better than your team, the next thing they say is prove it. OK, I'll put a dollar behind it, right? And then you have this you know, sports betting. What are they forecasting the growth from five, just in the US from 5 billion to 300? Oh my God. Sports book revenue today, about a billion? Five times. Five times in five years. Those are the kind of markets you can't keep money away from. Yeah, it's going to require some legal changes, but they're happening. Cultural changes, they're happening. I went to one of your, you guys have already been through this. For us, it's a big deal. I mean, I went to one of your bars. It was, you have some big race. Ladies wear fancy hats. What do you call that? Melbourne Cup, right? I happen to be giving a talk the day of the Melbourne Cup. Do not try and give a talk the day of the Melbourne Cup. And I was down in a little town. I think it was Geelong. Near here, a little post-industrial brownfield, right? It's a lovely town. So I'm not throwing stones. But they lost the Ford plant. They had a lot of trouble. They were doing something called an ICT cluster back in the day. It's been very successful, actually. And I'm talking to the mayor and the city council. <clears throat> what time is it? Well, on the same day as the Melbourne Cup was the seventh game of the World Series. Now, the World Series is not the World Series of anything. This is a sport called baseball. You may never have heard of it. But in the United States, we think that's the thing. And the World Series, seventh game, and my home team is playing for the World Championship. So, of course, the mayor and everybody understands the importance of sport and says, well, we knew we were going to make it home to see the time for the cup, but, you know, you're missing the World Series. They never heard of it, but you're missing your championship game. They said, we got to go. And we go to around the corner, down the block, into this bar about the size of this room. You know what this is going to look like, right? All the ladies are there in their hats, and it's full. And they're like booths all around the wall. Now, you've been to this bar already, because I know there's probably a 1,000 of them in Australia. And every booth has what in it? A TV. And what can you do on that TV? You can bet. 
Every booth had the ability to place bets on whatever sports you were watching, and there were like a thousand possible things. Now, of course, that day it was all the Melbourne Cup and da da da. So we go in and ask the bartender, I don't know what you call a bartender, but we ask the bartender, can you dial up the World Series for us in San Francisco? It's, you know, it's the seventh inning right now. He said, what sport? Yeah, what? And he looked in some book. Oh, yeah, channel 832. And he dialed it up for us in some booth, and he got us in the booth. And I watched the World Series and with my colleagues, and they all cheered for my team. I didn't place a bet, but I could have. My point is, you guys are so far ahead of where the US is going in sports betting, because it's legal here. It's culturally accepted. It, there are boundaries, probably cultural norms, in terms of how one behaves in this context. We don't have those norms. We're still in the world of Las Vegas. In other words, what happens in Las Vegas stays in Las Vegas. Maybe you've seen these ads. You know, the betting is like immoral, but you can go to Las Vegas and do it. But this is changing. Now we have state-sponsored lotteries. When I was a young man, I went to Mexico the first time. I'm sitting on the cafe on the street, and the guy comes by selling the lottery tickets, the purple ones, the green ones, the blue ones, and da da da. And I said, what a corrupt society. You know, the state, the government is selling me a government ticket, you know, a gambling ticket. This is corruption. You know, this is taxing the poorest, right? Well, that's what's all over the United States that's been happening for 20 or 30 years. You know, there's not just the state lottery once a week. There's the lotto, the motto, the motto, the grando, the whatever, the purple tag, the green tag. My point is cultural change happens, and it's a huge wave, and gambling is happening in the U.S. It's going to be a huge, huge market. You probably have an advantage relative to the United States in understanding how to bring gambling within a business context to a big market. I'm not pushing you to do it, just saying natural advantage. Oh my God, cultural change. Sport, right? I'm wearing a sports cap. Is this by accident? No. Messaging, right? Branding. But is that a sport? 22 years old, hasn't been outside in three weeks, sitting with a controller. Well, guess what? It's fitting a paradigm called sport, not because of the athleticism, but because of the business paradigm. Investors, athletes, and investors who have previously invested in the Clippers. I have some athletes here that played on the Clippers. Where are you? Raise your hand, right? The people that own the Clippers, specifically, among others, have invested in teams that compete in esports. Right? And we'll see some slides later of these massive stadiums physically filled with people who physically go to a site, tens of thousands of people to observe eSports. And they pay ticket prices comparable to ticket prices to go see the Clippers. And of course, it's virtually extendable. It's very easy. So it fits in your domain. So the purpose of that is to say, this world of sports tech is open for categorization. It has new entrants you might not have thought of, like, I mean, or, or naturally think of, like gambling and esports, but they fit the paradigm. And there are going to be emerging categorizations. Now, I was asked to talk about valuation. So here's the big message. The big message is how you categorize and slot yourself, how you Define who you are and what are your comparables has a tremendous impact on how you're viewed because people draw analogies, the power of analogy. So when we throw up something like this and you say, oh, I know where I am, I fit in wearables, or I fit in analytics, or you know, I'm here in esports, it's hugely important because people are going to say, oh, who else is in that category? How are, they, are there more visible transactions in that category? How do you comp? Or how are you com in comparison to those other elements? That's the essence of what I have to say about valuation. I have 3,000 slides on how to do valuation. I teach it you know, for almost a week at the university. But that's just math. In the end, it comes down to common sense. And it's all about comparables. So 
comparable. So you can say, oh, well, let's use another framework. My point here is to say there is no one framework, right? Maybe the framework is, you know, next generation fan or the future arena or the athlete of tomorrow. It's about performance. But no matter how we define it, it's a tiny market. E-tech or sports tech is a tiny market. You're going to tell me how big it is, blah, blah, blah. Fine. But relative to the rest of the world, it's small. And the lens that the rest of the world is going to use to understand you, first of all, is going to be this lens. You know, are they using big data? Are they using virtual reality? Is it really a digital media play? Is it about the facilities? Is it about IoT? You know, these may not be the market-facing de definitions for you, but these are certainly the larger platform definitions. So you're going to have to fit and figure out where you are on a platform definition, capabilities definition, and a marketplace definition. So there's no single, when you're doing comps, there's no single point of light. It's a convergence. We all know this, right? Because we've all bought real estate or thought about buying real estate. It's the same thing. What's the neighborhood? What's the school district like? What's, what's the access to the fire department? What's the community? What's, how far is the commute? All these attributes converge. Just different attributes. Same thinking. So fill your favorite map. No one of these maps is right. You can take control of defining the map. That would be a powerful thing to do. If I was an accounting firm, I would own that, right? I would say, here's our view of your industry, because that's analytic thinking. But this map happens in so next-gen media, media technology, fan engagement, f fantasy platforms, athletic performance, sponsorship, blah, 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 blah. Take control and define your own map. You can have multiple maps and say, from this point of view, this is what we look like. Another map, but it defines it by you know, market sector, youth and amateur, collegiate, professional, and then the sort of common sense sectors on the other side. So how does this fit with the broader world of technology innovation? Because we've gone far down the path of sports tech and positioning ourselves. What's the broadest positioning? This curve is the S-curve of technology productivity. It's a notional curve. There's nothing exact about it. It has a few takeaways. The vertical axis is performance. The horizontal access is investment, either in time or effort. And the message, the takeaway is simply, initially, investments are not productive in terms of performance. Then there's a period of small incremental investments with large payoff. And then that capability matures. So where it takes tremendous incremental investment to move the needle at all. An easy one for us to think of might be the internal combustion engine. And this might be a period of almost 100 years. Initially, there's a lot of com competition in the 1900s, 1910s between steam automotives, electrical automotives, gasoline-powered automotives. It wasn't given that automotives were going to be gasoline-powered. Now, there's a lot of advantages to each of those. The advantages of the gasoline engine came to be the ease of refueling. Right? It's a little harder to refuel a steam engine than it is to refuel something. Gasoline, for all its combustibility, is relatively stable, relatively portable in bulk. So setting up infrastructure, distributed infrastructure was easier than for the electric vehicle especially in 1910 when electrification was not a generally distributed resource in rural areas. So you had a lot of diversity and slow movement here, 
And all of a sudden, you come to like the Model T Ford, and you have mass production, and all sorts of things that increase and decrease price, increase performance rapidly. But I would argue since 1960, it's the same good old engine that it's ever been. Oh, you put a catalytic converter on the back end, reduce emissions, you do little things around the edge, but essentially it's pistons going up and down. Somebody tried, remember Raza, Mazda's rotary engine? That would have been a big innovation. Never caught traction, even though it's a great engine. It's a Winkle engine. So it's hard to change a standard once it's adopted. But this isn't a bad place to be. This is where you make money, because it's standardized. And if you have market share and access to customers, you're going to make a lot of money. Where you want to be, those of you in this room, you want to be right here, where knowledge, whether it's content, media, measurement, analytics, whatever, applied to a market, begins to have applicability and big payoff. And where you want to get out, because remember that contract with your investors, you need to get out. I know half you hate hearing that. You think you're building a company forever. But where you want to get out is before the game's over, before scale is all that matters. Because once scale is all that matters, the capital required up here is huge. It's not tens of millions, it's hundreds of millions, maybe even billions. So there's a place for us all to play. The universities and national labs, the entrepreneurs and rapidly growing companies and venture capitalists, and the mature enterprise. And there's a natural mi migration of capability across that spectrum. And as long as we recognize that we're part of a river, we're going to optimize what we return to our customers and to ourselves. So everybody wants to be in that sweet spot. They don't want to, not everybody doesn't want to live there forever. The universities really want to live here and experience that enough to inform their research. The big companies really want to live here, but have this inform how they address big markets so that they're truly maintain their profitability and relevance. So we have a real value to bring to bear as we, we, the entrepreneurial world, lead in that sweet spot. There's a natural dilemma here. It seems like, oh, this is like a marriage made in heaven. This is easy. It's not easy, because every time these technology platforms, this is just IT, OK, it's oversimplified. But these are the companies I had something to do with in my time in Silicon Valley. You know, every time we go through one of these cycles, it says, oh, it's, I see people draw this so that these curves just neatly go from one to the other, but they don't. There's something going on here. It's a dilemma. I want to get to that. So whatever industry you're in, there is a dilemma here. And the dilemma is the dilemma of the major corporation that has a solution and if you notice that this moment in time to move from this solution to this one that has greater potential means inferior performance, that the new solution does not work as well. So if you have customers who you have a commitment to, to be both innovative but also reliable, you have a dilemma. The ideal thing you want to do is wait for that magic sweet spot right there, that interesting thing, if you can guess where that is, and sort of shift technologies as you move over. Well, let's take the electrical vehicle again. How are our incumbents doing? How's General Motors doing? How is BMW doing? Mercedes, who's your favorite car manufacturer? How are they doing? I don't know anybody you can Audi. They all have a new generation of eagles. Maybe they're right about here. But they're struggling, right? They clearly missed the window to be a leader. They're struggling with the mileage.
problem, right? They all have this infrastructure. Remember the problem with the, the electrical vehicle in 1910 is the same problem we have now, that we don't have distributed regeneration for the battery. You know, um, if I want to drive to Perth, driving my Tesla is a challenge probably, right? So it, that's what puts it down here. It's inferior. Even a Tesla is still inferior because I can't drive to Perth. So even though I want to own an EV, all of a sudden I say, that means I have to own two cars. I need my mountain car for my ski trips because, you know, I can't rely on being able to recharge if I got a 600 mile, 1,000 kilometer, you know, week journey. So the crossover is coming. Ubiquitous charging is coming, better battery life is coming, et cetera, et cetera. But those crossovers are a challenge. The incumbents are great at putting better headlights on my car. Literally, I toured the BMW research facility about seven or eight years ago, and their big to-do unveiled to me, we have a secret here that's going to be fantastic impact. Look at these headlights. Look, no glare, brilliant. Automatically adjust, fog, it does this. Brilliant headlight. At the meantime, Tesla's bringing out the EV. So, in other words, BMW is probably, I don't know, the best car in the world. Audi, take your choice. But it's irrelevant. That, all those innovations, those incremental little market retention innovations, keep the contract with the existing customers, but miss the opportunity to attract a new segment. So that's great. The incumbents will do that. We won't do that. Here's where we step in. We step in when there's a new capability. We can bring a new market segment to bear here and then scale that market segment and take their customers when we cross over. You say, oh, no, the incumbent's going to win in the end. Well, they don't. Just look at those two guys. I'm staying at a beautiful hotel today. Thank you very much, whoever made those arrangements. I'm staying at the Park Hyatt on Parliament Square, I think it's called. Oh, it's beautiful. The lobby, I think it's all rosewood or something. Ever been in there? It's all gold and marble. Who do you think has a higher market cap? Hyatt or Airbnb? How many think Hyatt? I love to say you're wrong. Right? It's Airbnb by a long shot. How many fancy hotels does Airbnb own? Uh, five, ten? Zero. Well, I run a lot of events at Berkeley. I used to worry about it because I would say, uh, we don't have, really have a great uh, you know, hotel next to the university. We got some little boutique hotels. I'd worry about booking the hotel room. Used to be a trauma. Now it's no no longer a problem. I, I raise the issue with people. I say, do you want need me to help you arrange? Oh no no no, we, we'll just all use Airbnb. Thanks. So the whole culture, at least for the people to come and visit me in Berkeley, is different now. I'll get an Airbnb for a week in the neighborhood. No problem. They're all distributed. They're not staying in one place. Events are different. Right? Spotify, the music business. Anybody bought a CD lately? When was the last time you bought a CD? So whether this is your favorite model of disruption, you know, pick your flavor. These disruptions, data analytics, we're going to hear about it, virtual reality, these disruptions have this kind of impact. The stock market here. S&P 500, has it done well? I know it's volatile right now. For the last 10 years, has your stock portfolio done well or the stock portfolios of the world? What do you think? Better than average? How many think better than average? Come on, give me a hand. Better than average. Every hand better go up or you're asleep. Better than average? Let's see the hands go up. It's the best 10-year history of the stock market ever. 
I'm not sure that's right, but it's probably true. It's been pretty good, right? I mean, really, more than 10 years. Well, who, what? that's Amazon, that's Netflix, that's Facebook, that's Alphabet, Google. What does that mean? That means not against the best overall performance that you might call nominal performance, right? You and I have given, investors, retail investors, have given to these companies a premium that says, we want you to buy the world. We're giving it to you. In other words, it allows them to mint Bitcoin. Why is a share of Google worth multiples you know, of another content provider or another advertising agency, whatever you want to call them? Yeah, because of their growth, because of this, because of that. You're going to tell me about all the math. I'm going to tell you the implications are that these companies are in winner-take-all scenarios. And that this is the face of disruption. Back here, you know, that's 2012 back here. Back here, all these companies were nominally at zero. Okay, that's how this graph is created. So everybody's at par. Then you dial forward five years, and some of them are worth five times par, where others have only doubled. And that's great. Doubling in five years was great. If I would have said to you back here, hey, I can double your value in five years, you'd say, done, take it. So this disproportion of power, shifting of power, of people who now know how to stay in the sweet spot, right, and make those shifts in the curves is a great skill to them, and they're hungry to have you help them do it. So, another lens I want to offer you, a broader lens is the lens of med tech. I could make the argument for you that sports tech is simply a sub-segment of med tech. Why? Because measurement, feedback, at least in the performance attributes, measurement, feedback, analytics, all that applies to medical devices. It's more critical. It can attract, at least historically, investment in more traditional patterns because people understand med tech. So the analogy might be helpful to you. Maybe not so much in the media context, but in certain contexts. So in all these, everything here, trans, you know, sensors, there's an overlap. Example, Neurotrainer. It's a company, Berkeley-based, yada, yada. It's, it's a, one of their products is the Halo. You know, it's sort of a, it's a it, we used to do alpha wave feedback. This is alpha wave feedback on steroids because the electrodes actually um, exist, touching the scalp with the headphones as you perform the sport, and you get the feedback and it modifies, gives you information as to how you perform the sport. The Clippers are using it, by the way, and investing in it. So, no, so is this medical technology? Is it sports tech? You know, you call it. So you look at med tech, and there's all sorts of stuff going on. This is a thing called Clipper. You may not be familiar with it, but it's going to allow us to design babies. Now, nobody wants to think about that because, oh, it's, un, you know, it's unethical. But right now, this technology is being used. What's unethical? You're going through IVF, right? Artificial insemination. You want to have a child. You're 40 years old. There's 10 fertilized eggs. And they say, you well, one will be blind, one will be crippled, one will be purple, one will be green, and one will look just like you and be fully capable. What should we do with these 10 eggs? You're going to say, well, let's take the perfect one, and I'm sorry, we'll flush the others down the toilet. That's culturally acceptable, right? And that's where this technology gets created tomorrow. It'll be, do you want blue eyes or green eyes? This one will have an IQ of 140. This one, 128. They're both extraordinary. But the 140 is going to have emotional problems because there's going to be very few people in the world like it. You're going to have to give it special education to accelerate it. Your choice, which would you like? You know, we're just this close. 
A little digression on this. You're saying, why is this relevant? The young lady who patented the technology around this was, was sort of my niece. She's not a blood niece. She's a by friendship. And where was her technical training? She's not a biologist. She knew, not, knew nothing about biology. She was trained by my government. In other words, her postdoc was funded to do self-organizing networks of dr smart dust, which are drones that we would fly over Afghanistan and drop out a cloud of a 1,000 little micro drones. They would self-organize into a network to provide intelligence on where's the infrared and where's the data analytics and sensors. So it's the math behind that same stuff. It is the same math used to, do, used to do designer babies. Nobody had cross-fertilized, if you don't mind that term, cross-fertilized the technology from one place to another, but that's where we're coming. That's the convergence. That's where you get the rapid acceleration. You take a highly developed technology in one place, and you just say, oh, what happens if you put it in biology? <gasps> oh, we get to understand what's going to happen to this baby. So that's the name of the company. It really exists. It's public. Scary, right? That's like the gambling thing. You're saying, why is this relevant? It's exactly like the cultural shift I described in gambling. This might be a little easier and overt to understand because we're talking about designer babies. So we could go down the road of personalized medicine. The reason to point this out is where are these capabilities going to get deployed when they rely on data? And this escalating level of investment, the key word here is China. And you'll see why China is going to have a natural intrinsic advantage in sports tech and other things. Why? OK, let's do with the economies of scaling for a minute. Again, biology, PCR invented at Berkeley. The first one you could buy cost $5 million, et cetera. Go forward 20 years, it's $3,000 on your lab bench, replicating DNA. You don't have to know about this stuff. All you have to know is that scale is rapid, faster than anybody expects. Commercialization at scale reduces prices. A lot of old skills. This is, this is a skill of pipetting. Pipe biologists used to really get PhDs in pipetting. In other words, you could put a drop of something. It's all automated by robots. Drones, we fight wars with drones. Well, we used to have to put 6,000 bucks of hardware specialized in this drone to tell it what to do. Now we build them and put an iPhone in them. Literally, this isn't an analogy like, oh, the iPhone's smarter than the old computer. No, we put off-the-shelf iPhones in these drones and reprogram them. You know, so that was a $6,000, $600 price reduction. So bring it to sports tech. You're saying, Jerry, you're off in left field with biology. No, I'm not. Fitbit. Fabulous or fad, huh? Well, boom. Not a fad. Seriously, if you have an Apple IV watch, raise your hand. I can't believe it was just a couple. Come on, I want to see them. One, one two, three. Oh, come on, people. Get out there and buy a watch. I'm serious. Why is this thing important? I didn't buy an Apple one, two, or three. They were like the Fitbit. They were fads. This is a real instrument. You need to understand it. This will do everything your Fitbit did and tell you the time. Now they make that. There's a convergence, of course. Your Fitbit will tell you the time. But my point, this is a lot more versatile. Do your email. Do everything else. But once it does your heartbeat, guess what? It does diagnostics. If you've ever had an EKG, if you've ever been to the ER, and I look at the round of the room, every male over 50 should have been to the ER once with concern about his heart, and they wired you up. And they pulled a blood draw and everything else. Not, not, not going to happen anymore. You're going to call your doctor and say, hey, you told me to tell you if I was ever having a few bad feelings. It feels bad. And believe me, this is what the doctor says. He says, call me. And you call me. He says, go, go to the ER. Go to the emergency room. And they wire you up, and it costs $1,000, and they find that you're fine. Get out of here. Well, now this thing knows whether you're fine or not. Now, the doctor, we haven't gone through the culture shift. The doctor's not monitoring it 24-7. There's not a service like, triple, like automobile, like 
my BMW. I think it knows when I have a flat tire. I'm not sure, but I'm pretty sure that if I have a flat tire, because there's a button in my car that anywhere in the world, I hit that button and it says, can we help you? We're sending somebody to get you, right? If they can do that for my car, believe me, I'm sure this thing, you know, is just that far away from it. And in fact, if I fall, that's the screen that comes up. Are you okay? Did you fall? And if you're not okay, hit this button. And you know what? I fall. Seriously, I hike a lot. And it's not uncommon, I hike with sticks, it's not uncommon that I'll either fall or catch myself with a stick. And when I do that move, my wrist vibrates. It says, you okay? I go, yeah, I'm fine. But you know what it's doing every time I do that? It's saying, I, I can say, no, it's not a fall. Yes, I fell, but I'm okay. It's remembering me and establishing a pattern for what my normal behaviors are and when I'm not okay. So it's building an individual knowledge base, not just a generic one. So the idea here is these guys, will, I mean, if it's not obvious to you, I'm sorry, these guys lose the war, right? That's the point. They were great. They didn't keep up. They didn't exit when they needed to exit. They didn't make that important move. Their investors lost their money. So speed and scale matter when we're doing this stuff, ladies and gentlemen. It's not enough to be right. You got to be right, and you got to scale it up. We got to get out of Australia. We got to be global. We got to be dominant, and then we got to sell it. You hate me, don't you? I mean, I've been telling entrepreneurs they have to sell their businesses for 20 years. It's not a popular thing. So speed, there's all sorts of history of dual use between niche markets and consumer markets. We have to be on that kind of trend. Dual use led to digital health, AI, doesn't come from dual use, but it's an example of it. And this is your next revolution, and you know it. How many of you, oh, I hate to do this, because you guys are so bad at participating. <laughs> but how many of you are in a business in which data and data analytics are going to be crucial? Raise your hand. Yes! Thank you. So this is your major disruptive platform. It's going to be as big as the internet. It just about already is. It's going to be that embedded. It's going to be that expected. It's going to be an expected competency, whether you're doing advertising, whether you're doing performance, anything. It's going to be embedded, and it's going to be essential. The distribution of this technology is happening faster and faster. If I go back to a heat map prepared by CB Insights back in 2015-16, the heat was in healthcare and advertising. Healthcare because it's critical, advertising because the money's there. Today, that heat map is not a heat map anymore, it's a blur. It's like AI is everywhere. And guess what? You know, this is a year old. It should be solid red. So, speed's important. How do we, in a world of AI, how do we get the scale? Here comes China. That's how we get the scale. They have 1.3 billion people. Data is king. We used to say content is king, data is king. Well, more data is better. 24 million people, if you wired up everybody and had total performance metrics on every soul in Australia, not enough. They have more people in one city than you have in a country. Now, today, a billion of those people don't count. That's what's scary. They have 350 million people, the same size as the United States, who are in the discretionary consumption marketplace. They call it middle class. In other words, should I go get a cup of coffee? 350 million people, or a cup of tea, 350 million people can make that decision. Where the other billion have to worry about, you know, do they have enough to eat, right? Or, you know, safety, the, the fundamental things. Not a lot of discretionary money. That needle's shifting. 
So the United States mark of 350 is only going to go to 400, and it's going to be require, you know, a generation, and we're going to have some growth. Japan, I don't know what's the population of Japan. 120, 120 million. Okay, the thing I know, whatever the number is, it's going to 100. In other words, there's a there's there's a high level society where everybody's in the consumption economy, but it's actually decreasing in size. 60 million. Thank you very much, JD. Point is, where you go around the world, where are the needles going to flip? It's easy when you got 1.3 billion, not easy. When we got 1.3 million, to move to 500 or 600 million is going to happen over the next 10 or 20 years. As the economy distributes wealth more broadly, they don't have to grow. They can have a one child policy or a 1.5 child policy, and there'll still be over a billion, and they'll move, in the, and their data, the point is their data will double in size relative to the United States. And their data will be homogenous because they don't care about protecting. The government does not allow them to protect privacy, right? Where in Europe we have GDPR, it's, it's a great thing. But if you look at global competition, GDPR is going to kill Europe. Whatever we do in the, in the United States, we don't have GDPR. You know about GDPR, right? It's, it's, uh, that in the United States, we don't have GDPR. What we have is Facebook and Google and Amazon. We have columns, right? Nobody shares that data. That's proprietary. We're in China, the government knows everything. I mean, I'm sorry, my Chinese colleagues. But in the, in the back door, in a way, the data, nobody's able to control that. If they want permission to be the Alibaba of China, they have to share their data. WeChat, whatever. So you say, well, how is that relevant? Well, let's go back to the med tech example. Another huge trend, diabetes needs data analytics to treat, I mean, not doesn't need, but if we have powerful data analytics, we can enhance the treatment of diabetes, a chronic disease based on uh, performance and consumption, et cetera. Sounds a lot like med tech, health tech. Well, that's where it's growing. So you have the convergence. So it's going to be very hard. It's going to be, all of us are going to be keeping up with. And I hate to say that. My son worked for Baidu for a few years. He worked for Google, Google for a few years. And so from the inside, I get a sense of the different cultures of these companies. I'd much rather have them working for Google. But Google, believe it or not, is going to be at a competitive disadvantage to Baidu over the long term. So this type of convergence, all I'm saying is when you draw your market maps, when you think of the world, think of it big. And it might include how you relate. Because the power of analogies is huge. So, five minutes. Thank you. I just got my five minute warning, and in fact, my last slide. Nailed it. Nailed it. So, this is all I want to leave you with this morning a couple takeaways. One was, you fit in a cluster of innovation that has a number of components. And the secret component is how you fit, not just with investors, and you knew that, and maybe not just with you know, university and government, you knew that crap, but how you fit with the major corporations. And how, hopefully throughout the day, we're going to investigate the type of collaborative win-win relationships. So I'm not saying sell yourself to the major corporations today, tomorrow, because you won't. You won't capture your value. I want you to capture tens of millions and hundreds of millions of value for you, maybe billions of dollars of value for you and your stakeholders. Because the major corporation is not going to take care of your customer that you're so passionate about. They're, they're going to take care of their customers. No matter what lie they tell you, no matter how good a partner they are, once you do partner with them in a significant way, the vision is going to change, it's going to morph, it's going to turn you into more of that incremental enhancement serving their existing customer base. That's going to hurt. So I'm not trying to say it's easy. But the further you can pursue your niche market with your passion for your customer and strong demonstration of product market fit for that, the more you're in a position to sustain that as it evolves to being part of another enterprise. 
And don't worry about it. If you say, I'm going to be a public company and independent, fine. The more you can pursue that, you'll be a, a viable public enterprise. But believe me, public's not the end of the day. Some of my best wins are companies that go public at 600 million and get acquired by 1.4 billion, you know, like six months later. Because being public is like saying I'm for sale, you know, because you publish all this information. It shortens the due diligence cycle tremendously. It puts you in the marketplace. So you're always for sale. You got to understand that. Maybe I'm over making that point, but just understand that. So the power of analogy is huge because it's how you translate and talk about yourself and translate it into the, the language of valuation, the language of scale, the language of where you're going. Because if you can say, we are the Airbnb for uh, sport tickets, I don't know what. But people go, oh, Airbnb, I understand. You're going to utilize somebody else's infrastructure. You can be scalable with very little investment. You'll have a strong cadre. It'll be viral marketing. You'll be a strong cadre of early users. Whatever the analogy is. And you don't have to make the explanation because it's embedded in the analogy. So analogies are important strategically for you to always think of what are we analogous to and not just have one, but to have multiple analogies that fit for you, for your purpose. So thanks for your attention. Um, I'm available all day, and I'm going to visit with you at the end of the day. Thank you.